Our first reading this morning is found on page 912 in your Bibles. It's the fifth chapter of Amos 6 through 7. We don't read Amos very often. It's kind of fun to come back to it. Seek ye the Lord and live, lest the break, <laughs> lest he break. I'm sorry. Here, we'll come over here. The, the, that's right where I need to see. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour with none to quench it for Bethel. O you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth, they hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph, the word of the Lord. Thanks. Our responsive reading this morning is to be found on page 588. It's Psalm 90, verses 12 through 17. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, all have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. The word of the Lord. Our second reading is from Hebrews, chapter 12, chapter 3, 12 through 19. This is on page 1189. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as, it, as in the rebellion. <clears throat> For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that there, they were unable to enter because of unbelief. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 10. Glory to you, O Lord. These words will be found on page 1006. We'll be reading verses 17 through 22. And as Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. 
Do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This is the word of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let's begin this morning with just a word of prayer. God of all creation, Heavenly Father, thank you for calling us to this place called Trinity this morning. You are a gracious and a merciful God, and your mercies are new every morning. Open our hearts this morning to hear your word. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, grant that this gift of faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, might be strengthened by the same word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, our Lord and our Rock. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In this morning's gospel reading, we find a young man who comes to Jesus to ask a very important question. Now this young man is a religious leader. He's the head of the synagogue, which makes him a very prominent man in his community. And he's very well-to-do. He's considered rich. And this young man runs up to Jesus and kneels down and asks this question. Good teacher, what must I do in order to inherit eternal life? How a religion answers this single question will often tell us more about that religion than their answer to any other question. But this question tells us something about the natural approach of us humans to religion. The same question is stated in different words. For instance, uh, what do I have to do to find favor with God? Or we hear, what must I do to be justified before God? Or how about, what do I have to do to get on God's good side? The real The answer to this question will reveal the true center, the real center of any religion. Every religion, including Christianity, has guidelines for living. What guidelines do we have as Christians? Ten Commandments. Right, we have the Ten Commandments. Islam has the five pillars. Buddhists have the eightfold path. Every religion that I know of has its own set of teachings to tell its adherents what they have to do in order to find favor in the eyes of whatever authority it is that they believe in. And so this man was asking the the question which gets to the heart of every religion. And he's asking the question that most most every human being ultimately at some time during their lives will ask. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? But the words of this question are are a bit of a paradox. The words that I'm going to talk about are do and inherit. You see, in order to inherit something, you usually have to be named in a will, correct? And then the person who made out his or her will, naming you as a beneficiary, must die. You don't do anything. The only person, only the person making out the will can place your name into it. You have nothing to do with that. You cannot do anything to inherit anything. The hard truth is that you are either in the will or you're not in the will. The choice is not yours. And still this rich young man asks Jesus this question, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This man has money. He has status in the community, yet he instinctively knows that something is missing in his gaining the ultimate goal, which is eternal life. And since the young man asked what he had to do, 
Jesus' response takes the man right back to the words that he would have been very familiar with as leader of the synagogue. He takes them back to the Ten Commandments. Jesus gives him opportunity to examine his life by the use of the law. Specifically, the commandments which cover how we humans are to interact with each other every day. Jesus said, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father, your mother. These words are summed up best by Jesus in Matthew 22. Love your neighbors yourself. Now, as good Lutherans, we understand that the primary purpose of the law is to show us that we cannot keep God's perfect commands perfectly, and that we are in need of a Savior. So these words of Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, fire pit last night. <laughs> <coughs> so these words of Jesus should have cut the man to the quick. And hearing Jesus give the law, which shows us how we are to love our neighbors ourselves, should have crushed this man. For, I mean, after all, who among us truly can love their neighbor as themselves? Instead, the man replies, Teacher, all of these I have kept since my youth. And it seems really that the man truly believed that he had indeed been faithful to keeping the commands. These words of Jesus would have many of us begging for mercy, but not this rich young man. He a bit self-righteously believed that he'd already kept them all. Now just tell me what else I need to do. And it's at this point in the conversation that Jesus presents words of law which reveal the man, rich man's true problem, his true failure. Jesus said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. With this command, Jesus reveals to him his true heart. These words clearly show the man that he really did not fear love and trust in God above all things. Instead, this man's fear, love, and trust was in his money and in his possessions and in his status in the community. Jesus revealed that in spite of all of his good works, this rich young man had, had gold as his God. Let me ask you a question. What is your God? Do you, what do you fear, love, and trust above all things? If, what if Jesus were to come to you today and ask you to give up something? Is there anything in your life right now that if Jesus asked you to give it up, you would cause you to turn and walk away from him? A favorite hymn for Lutherans is, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Listen to a portion of the words from the fourth verse of this hymn. Were they to take our house, goods, honor, child, or spouse, though life be wrenched away, they cannot win the day. The kingdom's ours forever. Do you really mean it when you sing those words? What if someone asked you to give up your standing in the community? What if somebody asked you to give up your child, your house? If you are honest, you too will likely have to admit that you are guilty of having fear, love, and trust of something or someone more than your fear, love, or trust of God. And that would mean that you have an idol in your life. Mark tells us that Jesus loved this man with an agape love. In love, Jesus told the man what he needed to hear, not what he wanted to hear. This man needed to hear of the hopelessness of his situation. He needed to understand that even as he's doing all kinds of good works, there's nothing that he can do that will earn him eternal life. This rich young man needed to understand that he needed a savior outside of himself. He needed a savior outside of his own good works. And in revealing this to the young man, Jesus showed him love. 
And he did this even though that man might turn and walk away in sorrow. Jesus loves you and me in much the same way. He sends his Holy Spirit to convict us of our sin. The Holy Spirit comes to us through the word of God, using the words of law to cause us to look into those dark corners of our hearts to see our true natures. Using the law, the Spirit takes us to the depths of pure terror as he shows us the future that we have earned for ourselves. And then he shows us the true hopelessness of our good works. But praise be to God Almighty, we are not left without hope. For it is when we are at the lowest point that the Holy Spirit brings the soothing message of the gospel into our lives. When it, it is when we come to the realization that there is no hope for us in ourselves and in our own good works that the Holy Spirit shows us the hope that is in God alone. He shows us how God entered our history as a baby, Jesus Christ. And the Spirit reveals to us that Jesus was the only person who was ever able to live God's law perfectly, living the sinless life that you and I are just not able to live. And then the Holy Spirit, using the word of God, takes us to the cross of Jesus showing us how Jesus suffered and died, actually taking our place as the target of God's wrath for sin. The Holy Spirit then tells us that Jesus did not remain in that tomb. No, he reveals to us that Jesus rose victorious over sin, death, and the devil. And finally, the Holy Spirit actually gives us the faith that trusts in Jesus as we read in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved by faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. And through that same faith, we receive the forgiveness of our sins. God declares us holy in his eyes, and we inherit eternal life. And finally, we are free to stop asking that question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Instead, the Holy Spirit points to the cross of Jesus and declares, just look at what God has done to give you eternal life. You see, this is the difference between Christianity and every other religion. Christianity is honest enough and realistic enough to acknowledge that we will fail if we try to enter eternity based on what we do. And once Christianity shows us that we will fail, it shows us the good news that our salvation does not depend on our good works anyway. Our salvation depends fully on all that Jesus Christ has done for us on that cross. And when we ask, what must I do? God answers through his word found in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he answers us in Isaiah 64, verse 6, we have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like polluted garments. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. And again in Romans 3.10, we are told, none is righteous, no, not one. And finally, God answers in Romans 3.20, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. God's own word makes it very clear that the answer to the question, what must I do, is that there is nothing that you can do. And when we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, come to that honest understanding that there's nothing that we can do to inherit eternal life, then we hear these words of promises of God. They're from Ephesians 2.13. In Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And we read from 1 John chapter 1, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. 
And from Romans 3.24 we read, we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And finally, from Romans 3.28, we hear that we are justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is a central teaching of Christianity, brothers and sisters. Everything in the Bible points to the fact that we do not inherit heaven based on what we do, but we inherit heaven because of what God has already done for us in the work of Jesus Christ, his only son. Now, we don't know what happened to the rich man in today's story. The Bible doesn't tell us that. Did the Holy Spirit ultimately lead him to understand his true situation? Did he ultimately come to faith at some other time? We, we, maybe we'll meet this rich man in heaven. We don't know. What we do know is that we, like that rich man, have an empty place outside or inside of us. And we hunger for the assurance, the assurance that we have eternal life. And if we... Tr- if we try to find that assurance on our own, we're going to fail, but only the Holy Spirit can fill that empty space inside of us. Only the Holy Spirit can give us that faith in Jesus Christ that receives the gifts of forgiveness of sin and salvation and eternal life earned by Jesus on that cross. And he does this by convicting us of our sin with the law and then comforting us with the good news of Jesus Christ. In this way, the Holy Spirit makes us children of God and heirs of eternal life. Brothers and sisters in Christ, these are God's promises given for you and fulfilled in Jesus. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen.